You're listening to Graphic Novel Explorers Club Podcast, an audio book club. Greetings, Explorers. I'm one of your hosts, Johnny, joined by... Dennis! And hungover Francis. (laughs) The rarest of the collectible figures. Uh, (laughs) Right. (laughs) Actually, not that rare. Today, we are discussing I Moved to Los Angeles to Work in Animation by writer and artist Natalie Norgat. Or is it Nougat? Norgat. Norgat. And published by Boom Studios. We hope you've already read today's title because all three of us have read the book, so beware, spoilers ahead. Explorers can share their opinions and thoughts with us by leaving a comment on our Facebook page, over on Twitter and Instagram at GN Explorers Club. We're also now available on YouTube, so go check it out. So first, before we start this book, I'd like to give a shout out to our explorers in the United Kingdom. The UK is our second largest listener group. Wow. After the United States. And actually, pretty significant group of listeners over there. So I would specifically like to thank the people living in South Auckenden. I don't probably saying that terribly wrong. And now they're no longer going to listen to the podcast. Cheerio. O C K E N D O N. Auckenden. And Hi Wycomb. Man, they've wow. got. Strange names over there. Sure, thanks, <laughs> listeners. Reading. We're happy to fly over and do a live recording if you'd like to sponsor us. Yeah, we would love to do a live <laughs> event over there. And South Ockaden is where we have our biggest group of listeners falling largely behind, and they really need to do get their shit together and catch up is Lewisham, Witham, Corley, Birmingham, and London. London, get it together. Yeah, come on. Gosh. London, London. So disappointing. <laughs> But yeah, thanks for for listening to this podcast in the UK. And our apologies for me butchering your town name. Yeah, no kidding. (laughs) But we butcher all names here. Yeah, that's a running theme. Yes. Today we're looking at Natalie Norgitz. I moved to Los Angeles to work in animation. It was published in 2018. It's a biographical story about Norgitz. I'm just going to call her Natalie. That last name doesn't flow very well. Struggles to get into the world of animation. And it's really more of a how to guide than a straight comic book right or graphic well it's, novel. it's it's actually her journey and then it, it, it dropped with helpful tidbits of real information so this should have been a buzzfeed article what yeah you think so yeah because this is this is where the problem is i mean i liked parts of it let me just start with that before i go and bash her <laughs> it's it's so specific an animator in Los Angeles and it wasn't just autobiographical there was a lot of tips and like how to do it and I thought more it was really how to become a storyboarder Mm -hmm. right it's not even animation it's just a storyboard artist well or how to get I well we can get into it yeah I was just like "Mm, this could have just been an article like this could (laughs) have been a five minute buzzfeed like hey you want to get into animation this is what I did I guess I I follow a lot of animators on Twitter, and so this actually w- gave a lot of insight into what I've heard them talk about and their lifestyle, and I noticed a lot of them live in Burbank, and so actually it was very informative to me. I thought it was in- entertaining. It was geared specifically towards a person wanting to get into animation. I'm sure she, much like many of those professionals, get a question like like Johnny probably gets, hey, how do I start a podcast? How do I do this? So instead of answering a million times, yeah, it could have been an article, but you know she's also a comic book artist, so she figures she could have she turned it into Uh-oh. a comic book. Francis is fired up. <laughs> well, I don't want to jump ahead. <laughs> no, go go for is it. Is she a comic book artist? It was just loads and loads of copy. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, it was just big boxes of small text, and I was kind of disappointed. The animation that she did do, the drawings were good. Mm-hmm. I actually do like her voice as a writer, but edit yourself. And if you're an animator, tell some of the story with pictures. That's what comic books are all about. Like, it was just, come on. Yeah, oh it was. Goodness. there was a lot of copy, but I don't think it was any worse than, like, say, Alan Moore. Right. Like, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. There's which, which I also so complained much. about. I yeah. also complained about. Yeah. And to be fair, we should back up. This was kind of a last minute read for us, literally last night at like nine o'clock at night, because the one book that we wanted to read kind of fell through. And we've we've talked about wanting to do this book. So I think just like not just being with like, oh, I've got to cram mm-hmm. this in and like, oh my goodness, it's so much. And like, I get it. LA is expensive. California is expensive. Like But but yeah, well, I don't want to jump ahead. I mean, in, in defense, 
honestly, a lot of people have misconceptions about Los Angeles and California. And so I think she was trying to dispel that. Some of this probably came from a lot of questions. I mean, you're talking about her her direct audience is probably someone late in high school or maybe in their early 20s who feels like they want to get into animation and they're not exactly sure how to approach it. That's uh, fair. You know, unfortunately, some of it could be a little dated in the sense that it's very of its time in terms of like how much the rent is, et cetera. But I still say it's very applicable. And I, I don't know, I, I found that a lot of this stuff rung true to what I had gathered from tidbits of reading Twitter feeds from animators as well. So I think we should also say that the story kind of starts off. She lives in Portland, mm-hmm. and she's trying to. She does. She's a comic book artist, right? Yeah. And she does some other well, she, artwork for like a company. Yeah. She, she does commercial work as yeah. well as her own comic book. Yeah. She's a commercial storyboard artist, and she goes into that later about how she thought that doing commercial storyboarding would be a shoe in to get a job as a as a feature film and uh, storyboard artist. Yeah. yeah. And there, and there, she was just like, it's completely different how uh, a commercial storyboard artist, you have to be really precise and you're basically selling the product or the ad campaign. The whole look, yeah, everything. Through the storyboard, whereas with the feature films and, the, and TV, it's more loose because it's a, it's a constant refinement. So they don't want things to be really dialed in. They just want you to be able to express movement and and uh, facial movements and uh, just like a general sense a journey and mm-hmm. then when you do your pitch you really animate it through your physical performance yeah so it, it fo- follows her kind of starting in portland and then as she moves and tries to break into the industry in los angeles and i thought there were some really good things that i related to just working in marketing and mm-hmm. as a I think we both can relate to Johnny as a freelancer Mm -hmm. trying to break in. And one thing that she talked about, I don't know if I'm jumping ahead too much, but this is the hardest part about breaking into any industry, I think. And there's, I have a story too that's relevant. (laughs) She has her day job and trying to get into Los Angeles into animation. She would have to work at night Mm -hmm. to make these boards that she's not getting paid for Mm -hmm. just to kind of build her portfolio and to like prove herself. Well, she... To, to add on to that, what she does is she goes down to, to L.A. to visit a friend who works in animation. And this friend introduces her to a bunch of people that work at different animation studios. And there's a really beautiful thing where she's like, I knew I it was time to move down here when I was having a morning tea on my friend's patio. And this like strange cat walked up and it was November and I was in a T-shirt and, and pajama pants. And, and she's like, OK, this is the thing to do. So what she does is she, she prior to this, she was just kind of half-assing her attempts to like apply for studio jobs. Then she really gets into it. And and this is a, like a really solid tip that she gives. You look at what the studio wants, what their application process is, and then you build your portfolio around that. So she was constantly, like if they had a zoo project, I would go to the zoo and sketch at the zoo, which is smart. Like if you know who you want to go and work with, you should build a portfolio to show Oriented them. towards yeah, their work. Yeah. And she was constantly training. So she was she would be taking like Photoshop type classes. And- yeah. So she spent a year doing these like Lydia.com mm-hmm. and going to independent study courses, refining and refining and refining her process and learning yeah, Photoshop, Ill- Illustrator programs, all these other film school and it took her a year yeah. which is i think the point you were getting to right well no no um, oh, sorry. <laughs> also, I, did, I mean that's good background my point was when she's applying for jobs she had to go do all this other work on top of her current job right. and this is an example that i can give a few years ago when i wanted to leave my job i applied for a local grocery store because mm-hmm. they had a job in advertising um for their copywriter they wanted basically a full-fledged campaign and you i had like 24 hours to turn it around to meet the deadline and some of these i know i don't normally accept those applications because it just shows like everything they wanted they wanted a name of a new restaurant, the social media post, all these other content. It was like an eight-page document that I had to send. Damn. Yeah. And for a lot of artists, though, whether you're a copywriter, you're a designer, some places like require this and there's no compensation. And it's brutal. She obviously wasn't dating anybody at this time. And I bet she had no social life 
this year that she had to dedicate to right. that, which, I mean, kudos to her. I thought it was very representative. And even like as a freelance writer, I've had to take projects for no payment at first, but now I refuse to do that just to like to get your portfolio and to build your name and your brand. Let me ask you this, Francis, in relation to what you just told me. And I was a little confused because this is something that I've seen a lot, both in the book mentioned, not just by her, but at the end, they interview some other artists as well. And I've seen it on Twitter. But when they ask for these samples, so to speak, this isn't just like, hey, you know, like if I went into a job for administration, sometimes they hand you like a junk Excel sheet and they say, fix it up, right? And it's just, it's not real work. It's just to prove that you can do it. Right. Yeah, you but, know the program and how to. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. But when they ask you, hey, pitch this or do that, are they asking for real work for free essentially? So it's tricky. Usually no, because they want to see, but you have to do the real work to create the pitch. Okay. That's always a fear also that they could take the work and use it. And then just though, basically get free work. Right. But even if they don't use it, it's still so much time and mm -hmm. energy to create that and to build it and it's almost and she did go the extra mile normally your portfolio should speak to itself you shouldn't have to go to the zoo and draw an animal mm -hmm. for somebody that wants I mean she was smart to do it and I thought her representation of that was very accurate and I admired that like it's it's a hustle and it's yeah. hard while this book is about someone wanting to get into the animation field it is really good for I would say anybody that wants to get into any creative endeavor that has a specific company or group that they want to work with is you really have to put the time in right. to get. I was constantly applying at Pixar. This was like over 15 years ago, around mm -hmm. that time, trying to become a story art, storyboard mm -hmm. board artist for them. But I never really fully invested my mm -hmm. time in it like she did. Mm -hmm. So it's like no wonder I didn't get a job there. And you know, even or, when she did, I mean, that I what I loved about it was that she invested a lot of time, a lot of effort, and even then, she only got a small percentage of interviews well, out of that. To to, to counter argue that though, or like to a counterpoint to that though, is as things as she was doing this more and more, as things were moving along, she started getting story testing, which sounds kind of like what you were talking about, Francis. Where yeah. you got to go through this like rigorous <laughs> process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So an agency, sorry. To, to hold on on this agencies they have to do the same thing sometimes to get a client with requests for proposals but they'll require the client to pay them mm -hmm. they're like hey we're putting in a lot of work they don't pay well, for the I whole do with campaign my clients. like for a proposal once we no once once the proposal moves to a certain point and they're like okay well i need to buy equipment and all this stuff i'm like well we need to get a contract in place and pay me because i'm not just going to give you this work that I put right, in. Right, but that's what she's doing. Yeah. And that's what a lot of people well, are doing. They're so putting the, in a bunch of work just to prove that they can mm -hmm. do the work. Yeah, but what her one of her friends in the industry tells her is if you're getting to the point where the studio is asking you to do story testing, they see your abilities. You may not get the job, but you're at a level where they're like, okay, this person's on a radar. And that's when things start to slowly move forward with her. And I, and I love how she talks about she didn't believe in herself. She's like, I don't have... I don't have any professional training in animation. I'm too old. I'm outside of their their what they're looking for. And what she comes to find out and, and explains in this book, which I thought was done really well, and it's really important information if you're trying to work in any sort of creative realm, is just apply because what they're looking for is their perfect person on that on their advertisement for the position, but they will go with someone that maybe doesn't have enough experience, but their their demeanor fits what they're looking for, or they see the potential to like, okay, we can groom this person into what we're what we need. And, and that's that's true for any job, not just true. a creative field. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's but true. you are right. Like I think for a lot of things, it's, it's about finding the fit. And for writers, it's also with editors. You know, do they take feedback? Can I mm -hmm. can I mold their writing? Yeah, to fit she talks our... about that. Can you take criticism? Yeah. Like that's a really important. That's all you get. Yeah, that's all they do. <laughs> I'm bashing her book right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really liked it. Yeah, I there was uh, it was not what I was expecting because this book got lots of good reviews for the year it came out. It was recommended in a lot of end of the year recommendations for 2018. But I thought it was going to be more of like a Jeffrey Brown mm -hmm. biography about I moved down here and this is what happened to me. And it's basically like a how-to manual. Yeah. 
But it's all, yeah, but I found it how to as well in terms of just life. And you yeah. have to hustle. And yeah, you have to there's network. Cool. And it's in, there's a difference between networking and being schmoozy yeah. and using people, which she, she said she ran into some of that too. Yeah. Yeah. And I did like how, which, like, hello, this is not limited to LA, but her struggle, like, just like knowing what neighborhood to get into and trying to keep mm-hmm. it under 1500 a month. Yeah. Like, and she talks about strategies for finding an apartment. Yeah. And because, especially this is more specific to LA, that commute can kill you. So, where you live to your job is very, very important. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. It's crazy. Like, you could live super close. That would be only like a 10 minute drive for us. And for them, it could be like an hour or two. Yeah. It's, so there were there were things that I did like about this book, like her struggle, what she showed. I thought it was a very honest viewpoint. And to Johnny's point about how you do question yourself. Like mm-hmm. I've been writing for a long time and you'll get feedback sometimes and you can't take it personal. You have to build a defense. But if you're just getting negative feedback all the time and you're just like, God, can I even mm-hmm. do this? Yeah. Like, is it time to yeah. throw in the towel? But then you'll get like, oh, this is like you're a really good writer. Like, yeah, I know I'm a good writer. Like, you're an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> and it's harder to, I think, um, not to make it about me, but I am making it about me. What I have found working in marketing, working in the creative industry, people are much more likely to critique copy because they all know how to write. Right. right. Like, oh, I took English in high school. I took a creative explain, writing class. For someone listening, explain the difference between copy and writing. That's a great question. So this this is something that one of my teachers taught me, and it makes a lot of sense. You have to know what the rules are in order to break them. So we all know standard English writing. writing. And you don't end sentences with prepositions. You know, you don't what a full sentence is. With copywriting, you break a lot of those rules to get attention. Like one word is a sentence. You have fragmented sentences. Mm-hmm. You will start or end with propositions when you want to be conversational. Mm-hmm. There's also, when I'm writing something, I have to ask, has all potential questions for the reader been answered? And I kind of go through and make sure. I have to make sure there's a very clear call to action. When it goes through the review process, when it goes through routing, people are like, oh, we should add this in, we should add that in, you know, like, and all of a sudden, there might be three or four calls to action. That's not a clear, concise document, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, people will be like, "Oh, you can't say, you can't start a sentence with and." Actually, yes, I can. <laughs> like there, there <laughs> might know, be a reason. This reminds me of uh, the Beatles working with Martin. What's his their producer? His last name was Martin. Anyways, he was talking about the Beatles, and he comes from a background of traditional musical training. And these four guys had come in self-taught had played in bars and clubs mm-hmm. and brothels you know they had, had come from a completely different world and he and specifically is it which which song starts with a fade in i think it's eight days a week or mm-hmm. is it hard days night one of those songs starts with a fade in and he told him you guys can't do that music fades out you don't fade in and they were like no who says and he's yeah. like well right. this is my training that tells me and they were like no we can fade it in so that's how they did the song, and he was constantly dealing with this. No, these are the rules of music, and they and they would constantly just change it to be like, no, this is who says we can do it this way. So it's interesting that you're 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 talking about yeah. copywriting is breaking those so, traditional rules. So a lot of people have feedback, but what gets interesting is when you go to the design aspect, people don't have a design background. Mm-hmm. They don't, so they're they're much more hesitant to provide a lot of feedback. I've noticed, mm. or the, the feedback they provide is very interesting because they can't, they don't speak design. So they're mm-hmm. trying to convey something and it's hard to convey to your designer exactly what you're looking for or not. But I think it's easier for me to work with designers because I know what I'm trying to get across with the copy. So like mm-hmm. I can tell them like, hey, like this image, if they give me like photo options. So technically close. copywriting is, it's writing, but it's geared more towards like, uh, it's all marketing? sales driven. Yeah, it's all yeah. marketing. Copy okay. and so like comic book writing is very different than copywriting. Yeah, yeah. It's very different than storytelling, short stories. Content specialists are different than copywriters, even mm-hmm. though so, there's some overlap. Yeah, and I think that's what my frustration was with her. It was very clear she's not a writer. She doesn't have a writing background, and even though she did like a good job, it was just verbal diarrhea. And when we got to like. So we got through her story, and then she goes to like, here's all my friends' experience too. Mm-hmm. 
oh my god it's just blocks of i didn't even read it i'm like i'm not gonna waste my i I don't care i don't Mm -hmm. care about them and it's so much copy and that's the thing that a copywriter knows like you can't overwhelm the reader you have three Mm -hmm. seconds you have to keep their attention there's so much out there there's so much clutter to break through i i like the book but it was a little long for me and and sometimes a little redundant in parts like yeah i i i think it would have worked better if with the the people having their stories Mm -hmm. if she had dropped that in on on points like Mm -hmm. here's here's x talking about Mm -hmm. this their experience like Mm -hmm. i i think that would have because because when i got to that end too i was like well we've gone through all this like (laughs) all right yeah if it had been moved around a little bit to well, now you're going to hear from this animator. I'll, I'll say John Kay, even though yeah. he's a piece of shit. But <laughs> I, I could see that. But I could see she wanted to focus it only on her journey and her information. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. then at the end, it was kind of like it was an appendix of interviews with other people. Like, it's not just me. Here are other people's experiences. Yeah. And it was block text, but I found it, it was almost like you asked them a question and then they were just telling their story. So it wasn't so much... I mean, I guess they could have gone on and animated more of their stuff, but I felt it was it it needed to push the information that it needed to push. I felt it was both a a graphic novel and an informational, basically how I broke in. Yeah. So I I found I found it useful in that point. Je- Jenna Fisher from The Office mm-hmm. wrote a similar book about what I Gun learned acting. to get into acting because she's like, when I moved here, I didn't know, mm-hmm. I didn't know you had to go on hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of auditions. I didn't mm-hmm. know how to get an agent. I didn't know, you know, anything. Right. A- and so I, it, well, yeah, I just think this is a good book to have if you're looking to get into creative field. I think I would have liked it more if it was a book, like a sincere how-to, like short book, short story, or it was an article. Mm-hmm. I felt there was just a disconnect in the comic book realm. And I and I love personal essays when they're done as comic books. We read somebody. I don't know if it was season two or season three. It was an animator for Warren Brothers. Oh, the oh, a Dark Knight. It, yeah. And it True was, Batman. Yeah. yeah true. It was about like his like mental journey through and everything. Mm-hmm. And I thought that was so riveting. And it was, mm-hmm. you know, but this I was just kind of like, okay, I get it. Like, I don't know that the story or the way she told it fit the medium. But again, it could just be too because I work in the field. So mm-hmm. for me, I'm like, meh. But right. you're more critical of writing. Yeah, yeah, I was just like, and and to be fair, like I said the same thing about the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. We live the world we live in right now. YouTube commercials are six seconds. That's the attention span of people. Mm-hmm. I went into the bedroom to read the comic book last night. That's taking time away from my fiance. My stepson is home. Like I, you know, I had to rush through dinner. People are making sacrifices to read or to like watch a movie. Anything they're doing, it comes at the cost of something. And I, I don't know that it was worth the cost. I guess like I. Here's my strategy around that: read on the toilet. Oh gosh. <laughs> but you know, I would say it's it, that's true that it's you know for a person who maybe has zero interest in that field. But if you are interested or want to get in the field, or just to look at it as how you have to hustle just to get a job, I think it's great. I mean, it doesn't have to necessarily be just a creative field. I think people just assume people have success overnight. They're just lucky. They're just super talented. I find that That's a um, good point. that this shows the good and bad sides where look, I I didn't just get here because I happen to know someone. I didn't just get here because I was a good She was an established comic well, book she, artist. She talks about how it's like luck favors the prepared. That that right. saying. So someone said that to me a couple months ago. Uh, we hadn't seen each other in a while and I was at this at this networking event and he said to me he's like he's like man do you know how lucky you are to be produced like people are having you produce stuff i was like yeah i'm lucky but i'm like i bust my ass to do this he's like mm-hmm. e-, and i'm like and i do this a lot and he goes yeah but even there's people out there that work as hard as you and, and are trying to to do this and they're not having the same luck i was like well i also built up a large network of friends and, mm-hmm. and people that you know were interested in this and so it was it was being in the right place at the right time and having the right skill sets and and the drive to want to do this you know like her like she she busted her ass for a year right to get her her job and it came at 
with the recruiter saying, look, you weren't right for this job. Apply for this one and I'll recommend you for it. Right. Well, and that that's happens how she, a lot too. Yeah. That happens. And, and yeah, Even that not was, in the creative industry, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Where, you know, they were like, look, I, we really, you know, whatever. We like your personality. We like your work. Right. This job isn't right for you. Apply for this one. It's going to be up in two weeks and all. And that's the same thing that happened with her getting an apartment too, was she's just hitting all these roadblocks. And finally she thought outside of the box and the, the person that she was staying with, which I thought was hilarious when he when she called and was like, hey, can I crash you? And he was like, oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, way to make me feel comfortable about staying there. I will definitely try and find an apartment super fast. And she asked him, do you like your rental company? He's like, yeah, they're great. So she called them and just, hey, do you have anything available in this price range? And they said, just submit an application. And when something comes up, we'll call you first. In fact, I hear that's how you're supposed to do it around here. Yeah, in Sacramento, oh, really? it's yeah. like don't wait for if there's an ad, it's too late. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to completely discredit Dennis, so I do think you bring up a, a valid point. Like it, it, it does. It would be interesting for people to know what the hustle is, what it mm-hmm. takes, and that yeah, it's not just luck. People aren't. It's not just always knowing the right person too. She went above and beyond because this is the job that she wanted, mm-hmm. and she yeah. worked to get that job. Well, and we're. Honestly, we're seasoned professionals. We understand how this works. We've worked for a while, but you'd be surprised at how many people don't understand the basics of getting success. They they think that they get their cell phone on them and their YouTube star within two yeah, seconds that's or true. an esports star. They don't understand like you have to whatever it is, even if you're doing YouTube, you have to hustle. Yeah. And designers, there's always new programs, there's always right. new things to learn, like with writing. There's all these seminars that you can go to because, yeah, even though once you're in, you still have to maintain your skills. And when technology changes, you have to be able to adapt to that right. change. So, and yeah, you're right. The, those people will. A couple of other little things about the book. I, I like how it was kind of bookended with her where she was in life. Like mm-hmm. the Portland starts off. It's much more just like what she was doing in her life, what was going on, where she was at. And then the the, the book ends with her going on a hike with her boyfriend and and when she goes into the canyon, because they, they probably drive out to like Mojave or, you know, somewhere out in the outskirts of L.A. And she's just like, everything's brown. And then she slowly, her eyes adjust and she starts to see more definition in the landscape. And then they have like a little lunch or something and, and watch the sunset. And just everything's illuminated. And she concludes by saying, maybe L.A. is just an acquired taste like that. Maybe it takes some time for your eyes to adjust. And I thought that was a really beautiful if the book had ended on that, I would have been like, oh, this is a really good book. But yeah, then it goes I into... Well, it, I kind of feel like it really did end on that. And the other stuff was kind of, you know... Tacked on. I just felt tacked on a little it, for It me. was tacked on, but I think on purpose. Like, No, yeah, there was a point to it. But, yeah. But, uh, but see, I'm going to respectfully disagree again. Because as a writer, knowing when your story ends, it's going to have the most impact. That was the impactful place to stop. It would have been a beautiful story. But then you just... Throw on this diatribe after just which because, is why I think if those had been moved up and yeah and, and kind of well, spread throughout. I saw it like in. like Alan Moore. You know, you have the comic book, and then sometimes you have a little article at the very end. Now you know those are separate from the comic book because it's just words, completely. But I think th- I saw that is the same thing as kind of mm. like an addendum. Like by the way, if you're interested, here's some other perspectives yeah. really quick. And I'm sure someone who really wants to get into animation work is gonna. It will read those, but for us, I, I was just like, eh. I guess that's what I'm. That's what I'm struggling with. How many people are there who really want to get an animation? Who are also comic book readers? Like your audience is super narrow with this. I I would see. I have, and I might be a, completely wrong. There might be people in United Kingdom right now. That's their goal. <laughs> in South Africa. Yes. I have a skewed view because I follow a lot of artists, and some of them are either comic book artists or or web comic book artists who want to get into animation or the other way around they're comic they're animation people who feel like they're not doing anything and she speaks to this they're not doing anything worthwhile for them right mm. they're just churning out art yeah. for the corporation but they're not creating their own comics and she tries to address that work life balance of like making your own thing and, and she and she also that. talks about these studio environments about how She's at a studio where they give her lots of vacation. She's got right. this like downtime because she works in feature films. She doesn't work in TV animation. So she just kind of rolls into one production. But if not, she's got this downtime where she learns different programs. Mm-hmm. She'll work on her personal projects. Right. 
before the next movie starts ramping up, and then she knows she's going to be busy for like eighteen months. Right, and yeah. that, and it's a great point. It's, that one is specifically for animation because you're not just at the same studio necessarily for a huge amount of time, which she addresses that. She she's seen it, but most of the time you're jumping from studio to studio, you know, working on the next project. Sometimes headhunted yeah. for another studio. Right. All right. Well, I kind of think the book is. Not quite a comic book, not quite a how-to manual, but I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I didn't hate it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I loved it. Yeah. I mean, like, I I would recommend, like, I think it's worth the read, but, like, as I texted you guys last night, like, I read it Francis style, where mm-hmm. I just start, I start skimming, because I just, you've lost yeah. me at a certain point. Yeah. You've lost my attention at a certain point. I guess I ate it up, like I said, because... What did you think of the artwork? Oh, I loved the artwork. Oh, you did? I, I thought it was very good. I actually even liked the addendum stuff, because I thought it was insightful reading through uh, some of those people's experiences. You know what? I In the four years we've been doing this, I don't know if Dennis has ever said, I hated this book, I don't recommend it. I think you have like an appreciation <laughs> for all <laughs> levels of effort. No, I think a fire. I think I was really harsh on that one. Yeah, we were all oh, kind of yeah, sure. That was terrible. <laughs> and and we, we well, we saw positives and negatives in the in the Legend of Luther Strode series. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Boy Genius Barry Ween. Oh yeah. 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 That, that one. was another okay. one I tore up. <laughs> okay. Okay. You. You. Sorry, Judd. You had a few. I'm all not right. just a nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, where can people follow you, Francis, if they want to see your copywriting? Oh, you need to. <laughs> You go to the website. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you want to see my photos, you can follow me at Words in Waffles on Instagram. All right. And Dennis, where can they follow? On Twitter and Insta, you can follow the podcast at GN Explorers Club. Also wanted to say congratulations to Frankie. She's going to be gone for a little while because she's getting married uh, hey. very soon. We're already married by the time you hear this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah by the time you <laughs> hear right this. right before She'll... the wedding. But, uh, but you're going to be gone for a couple months because you're getting severely busy with with that yes and you're going to your cocoon thing. your yeah. egg and you're gonna emerge from it a beautiful bride <laughs> that was so creepy <laughs> she's not mothra and then she's gonna consume andy <laughs> yeah she's part praying mantis yeah yeah but yeah congratulations well, to you and you. andy for making it official i should write a comic book about the you bs should. wedding planning you, you should. should it's gonna be called and then some we'll BS. rip it apart yeah <laughs> why is there so much copy there's, there's hardly any copy we'll send it to everybody we were critical of oh my gosh feedback. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah we're really happy for you and oh, you. uh we'll see you i guess in a few months yep yeah some of you might see me at the wedding yeah i will maybe and, and sasha we'll will see. Yeah, this guy over here. I don't know. But uh, thanks for listening, and we'll we will be back in uh, two weeks. Bye. What's her name? <laughs> Where's Rachel? Where's Rachel? Harvey Dent. Can we trust him? <laughs> what? You don't know, you don't know that, that skit <laughs> from The Dark Knight? There's a guy who makes a joke. That's all he says is Harvey Dent. Can we trust him? And yeah. then he tries to dis- disappear because he's Batman. I'll send you the link.